There's new risk factors for type 2 diabetes. According to the International Diabetes Federation, 2015, approximately 9% of all adults have diabetes. And let me just remind us, as we begin to look at this study, you'll see some analytics here. One of the things to remember in terms of filtering the findings that the science creates is that clearly at least 90% of prediabetes is totally unrecognized. People have it and they don't know it. So that's where I'm saying, if your BMI is 25, 27, and you don't look like Arnold Schwarzenegger, and you don't have a waist of 32 inches, you may have some issues here that your doctor has not pointed out. The science is really clear on that too. Doctors don't know how to diagnose this prediabetes issue. And as far as the big killers, the big disablers, heart attack, the big killer, and stroke, the big disabler, you don't need to have full-blown diabetes. All you need to have is that unrecognized prediabetes to have major risk for this issue. So remember that as we go through the analytics on this study. There's a whole bunch of cases there that didn't get recognized for this study. Now there are certain established risk factors for developing diabetes. We know what some of those are. Obesity, for example, aging, which I just mentioned. A new Sweden-based study in the journal Diabetologia has identified 19 risk factors for type 2 diabetes. And this is the screenshot of the study. An atlas on risk factors for type 2 diabetes a wide-angled Mendelian randomization study. And again, let me just clarify something else for you if you're thinking, oh, well, you know, that's diabetes. I don't have to worry about that. Be afraid. Be very afraid because 99 out of 100 people who have this risk factor, again, don't have full-blown diabetes, but they've got, quote, pre-diabetes, which is the same disease process. It's just you and your doctor have not documented a fasting glucose over 125 or a challenged glucose over 200. But it's the same process. So think about that. Again, as we mentioned before, Mendelian randomization. And just a couple of comments about that. For those of you who don't know, I spent years at Hopkins as an epidemiologist, faculty teaching other doctors preventive medicine. One of the things we did, again, was epidemiology. What that means is it's not just studies of epidemics. It's what we call denominator medicine. Instead, of studying all the diseases in an individual, we study one disease in all the individuals at the time. So that becomes very statistically oriented. I also did some, a little bit of postgraduate work at Stanford in genetics. Now, having done all of that, you would think I would be able to understand Mendelian randomization, but I have to tell you, it just made my head hurt. It is one of the more difficult concepts to wrap your head around. So having said all that, let me just try to give a little bit of generalization on that. So what it's based on is the assumption that of all the what, 80,000 genes in the human genome? Somebody fact check me. I don't remember. It's a whole lot. Their assumption for Mendelian randomization is that the majority of these genes are going to be randomly associated as we develop the gene pool, as people mate and develop the next generation. So one of the things that you have to think about is, well, that's saying maybe the genes for height or weight or eye color or hair color are randomly associated. And I would tend to say that's a big assumption. Maybe they're not so randomly associated. Maybe they might have a little bit more to do with mating and continuing your genome in the gene pool. So anyhow, I'm not gonna go any deeper in that. I'm gonna leave those comments there. So here's the other thing that they did. They took 238 studies, including 40 individual papers. So in other words, it's more than a meta-analysis and there's a term for that. Umbrella study, I think is the technical term for that where you're not looking just at one meta-analysis, but you're looking at many, many meta-analyses. They identified 97 risk factors from which only 19 increased diabetes risk. And we'll go over some of those a little bit later, but again, there's just one that shown really big at the top. And yes, I'm still keeping it at suspense. This is my version of creating a cliffhanger. The study included information over 74,000 people with type two diabetes, over three quarters of a million control participants. The median age was 55 and gender distribution was about equal. So again, huge numbers, which you would expect from an umbrella study, a study which looks at multiple different meta-analyses. So here's the punchline. The most relevant new risk factor was insomnia, lack of restorative 
healthy sleep. So to go back to some of my comments, yes, there's a book. It's called Why We Sleep. It's by a fellow named Matthew Walker. He's a PhD type. One of those guys that started to go to med school ended up redirecting into PhD work. I think he was faculty at Harvard or MIT for a while. He's now over at one of the universities in California, I think Berkeley. And that book, Why We Sleep, is a fantastic book. I've personally read it about eight times. I personally have sleep problems. I will wake up at like three or four in the morning. And in the past, I used to have a whole lot of difficulty getting back to sleep. I've used a lot of things, you know, sleep hygiene is the, the big bugaboo for most people, but I think there's a lot more to it than just sleep hygiene. For me, two of the key things that I've done to improve my sleep dramatically are number one, resistance training. We're talking about multiple reps, dozens and dozens and dozens of reps. I'm talking about repetition. You're wanting to build muscle, especially in your legs, the large muscle groups, which drive your metabolism. So we're talking about 40, 50, 100 reps, obviously using lighter weight. You can crank up to the really big weights after you've already created fatigue in those muscles from the lighter ones. And I know a lot of people say, Doc, you're wrong. You just need to do three to five major reps using as much weight as you can. We can debate that later if you want. But the point is, that's been one of the things that's helped me more than anything else with sleep. The second thing that helped me even more was slowing my breathing rate down. I had heard about meditation. I had read it. I had tried it. And it's very interesting. You know, you look at the research, the science, the science is pretty clear. Most of us don't get a whole lot out of meditation in terms of actually lowering our blood pressure, having other impact on health. We do. It's clearly something positive. But if you look at the science reviews done by the American Heart Association and the FDA, and I know everybody wants to beat up on them, and I want to beat up on both of those groups too. But here's a point. They have done a lot of research on the science behind blood pressure and breathing. And they said, you know what? Biofeedback, it helps a little bit, but not a whole lot. Meditation doesn't really help. It helps some, but not as much as device driven, slowed breathing. We've talked about this several times on the channel. A device group introduced themselves to me at one time. It was called Respirate. And here's what I discovered. That device actually measures your breathing rate and your expiratory phase. And here's the critical part. This is not so much an advertisement for Respirate as it is just a discussion about the importance of sleep and a couple of things that can really help improve sleep. We went into the science when we talked about those in the past. And here's the thing. It's not just slowing breathing rate down a little bit. It's going from a quote normal breathing rate of 20 per minute down to 10 or less, really slowing your breathing rate down. The other piece is that expiratory phase, having a much, much longer expiratory phase than inspiratory phase. We went into the science on those and what happens is those two things really stimulate what's called our parasympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system is what gets us up and going. It's the fight or flight. It's epinephrine, adrenaline. Parasympathetic is the opposite. And you know what? From my early 20s until just a couple of years ago, when I woke up at three or four in the morning, I had a hard time going back to sleep. And often I would just go ahead and get up because I toss and turn. And you know what? I wonder how much of that drove me ending up being one of those skinny guys, you know, older, skinny, so I kept the weight off. And my BMI has been between 20 and 22, but still developing significant prediabetes, actually even to the point of full-blown diabetes. Sleep is a critical piece. Again, once I did a lot more of the resistance training, added some leg muscle, and especially slowing that breathing down, I've gotten to where I can reliably get back to sleep. I'll still wake up at two or three in the morning. I woke up at four this morning, as is very typical of me. In the past, I would not at that point have been able to go back to sleep. This morning, I was able to go back to sleep and that extra sleep makes such a difference.